Holy shit. Ooh. That's what uh, what they do to wake up people who fainted, basically. Is that like a like a smelling salts kind of a thing? Mm -hmm. Like you see in that? Yeah. Ah, gotcha. Yeah, that's what that is. Hence the plastic bag and all that. There's a heart rate jump. <laughs> I was like, yeah, there's that. There's that. I was like, okay. Burning sinuses. Sweet. Kind of feel like I'm drowning for half a second. Awesome. Oh, and there's my heart rate pop. So <laughs> I'll lay off the coffee for a second. Yeah. Let that settle down. So um, <laughs> what I'm gonna say. So on a scale of one to ten, ten being the most painful. This was a what two maybe? two something yeah. like that. Like yeah. it's, it's it's so it's brief. It's a brief burn, and then and then it kind of goes away, and then. Yeah, and then it feels like your body's trying to process what the hell just happened, and it's like, I, I, okay, everything seems to be cool. Sorry, it was too late to shut down the heart thing before we realized everything was fine. So that's gonna happen, but it'll go away. That's kind of the vibe that you get. I don't know. Yeah. What was, about the internal state? Did you, you change your awareness internally? You feel the excitement, like all of a sudden your body, like everything kicks. You know what I mean? Everything kicks on. It feels like your senses kind of just jump, like, mm. like a, like a like a fight or flight kind of response it feels like a, mm -hmm. it's like a partially a reaction to pain but you know because your sinus is like some foreign substance has done a thing and mm -hmm. obviously it's not pleasant and it's not good for you so mm -hmm. your body is like hey hey mm -hmm. you should react to whatever that is <laughs> um but you do f it, it does feel like turning on a switch mm -hmm. like you you describe that kind of power lifter like it does feel like, like yeah like it's an instant jump start mm -hmm. to some higher place of awareness, energy, you know, like right now I feel like my eyeballs are like, yeah, kind of like, yeah. <laughs> ready to go. Either that or I'm just conjuring the whole state. Ready to go. But yeah. yeah. Um, so thank you for being here. Yeah. I'm excited to have this conversation. Thank uh, you for having me. Yeah. So as I explained to you, Noble Warrior earlier, mm -hmm. It's all about inquiring what it means, means to be men in modern times. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, mm -hmm. I actually, so we'll start off a little bit different than how I would start off. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's just start off with how I normally start off. Do it. So we have Frank with us here today. And in, interesting about Frank, I actually know about him before I met him in person. Uh, our recruiter was very, very excited <laughs> about how he's coming on board and he's bragging to all of our candidates about how this guy is, is joining our company. He's going to bring all the glory. And then, <laughs> and then I, I believe he also told me that someone said, hell yes, I'm joining this company because Frank is coming. <laughs> so even before your physical money. presence was here, your clout alone <laughs> supposedly brought in someone else. Big. So it's a big ramp up to this question. Yeah. What are some of the pivotal moments in your life that make you Frank, the person, Jesus. the man that you are today? I don't know. Do you have like 40 some odd years to like sit here and talk about it? Um, uh, I'm one of those people that feels really like vehemently feels like you are the sum of all the, the most minute parts of like all of your time. Um, and thanks for that intro, by the way. That was like that was that was very intense. And Victor's one hell of a sales guy. So um, grains of salt for everybody. And whoever that person was, I apparently still owe them money. Um, <laughs> You're too humble. And it's a hell of a ramp up. Moments that made me, me, man, there's, uh, this is an interesting way to open this up because it, it obviously sets direction and it, um, there are, there are lots of, lots of moments like that, that I can identify, um, if I keep it, I don't know, man, there's a lot like, you know, I've, I've, I've gone through a divorce in my life. I've, I've worked many, many jobs um, in, in, my, in my time, as brief or as long as it, you want to think of it, depending on your point of view. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I, I would have to say there was a time when um, I used to work for, uh, I worked for a company called Bluestone Software, and then I worked for, no, forget that. Mm. I don't want to go there. Mm. That's stupid. That's boring. Let's talk about work things. Let's talk about personal things. Burning yeah. Man was a major pivotal point in my life. Great. Let's talk about that. Cool. Um, 
It's also very easy for me to talk to. I would talk about. Um, so Burning Man, somewhere uh, around the around the turn of the new year of uh, 2010, um, I had decided, or I had started to realize that I was kind of in a in a weird place. I was uh, kind of depressed a lot. Um, I don't know if I was clinically depressed, but I felt very depressed. Um, I was very anxious. I felt um, like irritated all the time, like little things, very small things, maybe angry or mad, like, and I would jump out of nowhere. And it was like, it was kind of crazy um, to like kind of note that. And I felt like something in my life needed to change. My, my marriage was, my first marriage was not in a good place. Um, it hadn't been for, I don't think a while. And my job was rough and like just everything in my world felt like it was kind of falling in on me. And I, for years, have been hearing my friends talk about Burning Man because I had friends who were serious burners and they had gone for, you know, either four to six years, depending on who you're talking about. And they're like, you need to go to this and you're so creative and you would love this and it'd be fun. And I was always like, ah, it's like, you know, really hot out there in the desert and like really dusty and I don't really camp you know, per se, like I used to, I was a Boy Scout and stuff, but like, it's not my vibe anymore. I mean, it's cool, you do you, but like, eh. And somewhere around that time, I just, like I said, everything was kind of pushing in on me. I felt like I was having a hard time dealing with a lot of things and I felt like I needed to make a change. And I felt like I was asking myself this question a lot, whether or not there was something wrong with me. And I didn't know if there was something wrong with me and I needed like help, I needed drugs, I needed a therapist, I needed a something, um, and, uh, or I don't know. I was worried about me and I just decided that I needed to put myself into a situation that I could not control that was completely new that was completely out of the realm of anything I had ever known before and like see what happened see if I was still capable of dealing with things that were outside of my control because I felt like that was a thing for me like all these things in my world felt outside of my control and I couldn't handle it yeah. so I just out of nowhere I decided I started to read about Burning Man and I was like and I'd heard the stories from my friends who all admitted that they couldn't actually describe it. You had to go and it was a thing and you just never, you can't even imagine. And I was like, all right, I'm doing it. So I went and I bought a ticket. And, um, and then I called up my friends. I didn't even do it before. I should have probably asked them first, but I called up my friends and I was like, hey, guess what? I bought a ticket to Burning Man. And they were like, oh my God. All right, I guess we're going to Burning Man this year because they hadn't really planned on it. So off that whole process started. So then it became a Burning Man as a process. It's kind of an, an interesting thing. It's not just a week in the desert or a few days in the desert or however long you're out there. It is a process because it's so big and it's such an undertaking, especially if you're coming from Boston. I was coming from Boston at the time. Oh, wow. So like trying to find, figure out what you're going to do, make plans with the people you're going with, put together a camp, come up with some way to give back, what your theme's going to be, do the things. And it, like from that high level all the way down to pure logistics, like, okay, I'm going to be in the desert for a week. Um, how am I going to survive that, right? It's like 115 during the day and 48 at night, and you need camping supplies and water, and you bring everything in. And so you go, and that, that, was, that was kind of an amazing process, brought myself and my friends together, I think, as we kind of walked through that. And the excitement ramps up, and, and then I got to Burning Man, and um, I don't know, I, just the moment, from the moment that we got into a cab to go to Logan Airport in Boston, the three of us, because we were meeting three other guys from other parts of the com country. Um, one other guy from San Francisco, we were flying to Oakland to meet him and then drive. And then we had a couple friends coming from Southern California. Um, by the time I got in the cab, I just, everything lifted. It was, it was weird. It was really, really strange. It was like this huge backpack that I had been carrying around full of rocks and God knows what else. Like I just, I took it off and I put it down on the side of the curb and I got in the car and went to Burning Man. And it was amazing. Every second of it was just purely amazing. So, um, so, yeah. what, so in what way it changed your life? Or it, it was pivotal for your life? It was pivotal for me, or at least I feel it was pivotal, because, um, again, I was in this, what, what felt like really dark place. Mm -hmm. And um, it reminded me, and I felt like, I didn't feel like there was a way out of it. Mm. And it, it helped me see that there was a way and it was my way. Mm. I could make that happen. Mm. I was in control of that. Mm. All the things that were weighing me down and that were beating me up and, and just oh, God, all that stuff. Like I said, that was my backpack. That was my thing. I know it's like an overused analogy, but like that was my crap that I could just put down. Mm. And I was in control of it. And it, that was the reminder. 
That's mm-hmm. what, that's what Burning Man was. Burning Man was a reminder that it's not the it's not the things you can't control. It's not the unseen. It's not the like the the. The, these weird outside forces that we talk about like all the time and people will just be it's, it's you you know mm. it's like you it's about how you want to approach the world mm. and that was the reminder for me and it's something I still try to remind myself of today because today these things still encroach upon me of course I think they do for everybody and like it's just it's a good reminder to sit back and go no 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 it's your world mm. everything is a choice and you can you have the power to do these things so use it mm. So that's why. It, it's, it's one of those things that the Buddhist philosophy is life is suffering. Mm. And primarily the source of suffering is this attachment, you know, craving for these positive emotions yeah. or this aversion for things that you don't want. Mm-hmm. And when you are not allowing, when you have this attachment to this craving and this aversion, then that's when suffering happens. Mm-hmm. And it only happens between your two years, mm-hmm. right? It's made up in, mm-hmm. your, in your brain. But it's one of those things that's easy to say. Just, yeah. Just let it go, man. Yeah, no, it's so And it's only the person that was suffering can yeah. let it go. No one can do yeah. it for them. Yep. It's kind of like what my, one of my mentors, one of my teachers said, I can't pee for you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So, so, but, but it's so easy to say, it's hard to do. So yeah. what exactly happened in Burning Man that had you gotten that in the embodied way and then that allow you to finally let go? In addition to the intellectual understanding and letting go. Sure, sure. Things. I think, so let me echo what you just said. Like what you just said is so right. It's so easy to just say, like put the stuff down. Um, and I think what happened to Burning Man what happened to Burning Man was that everything at Burning Man was foreign and just everything from the moment that like I landed in Oakland to go to some guy's house who I'd never met to sleep for like three hours before we packed up a minivan and like hauled out into the desert um like just just every bit of it is strange and um um I don't know, like when you get there and you know, you're meet, you're, you're met by people at the gate and if you're like, uh, 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 they call it a virgin, right, to, to Burning Man, you know, you, you get out of the car and you hug the playa, which is basically, you know, the moment you go from clean to dirty until like you leave again, right? So that's just this moment. And it's like, you get out and you hug the playa and the people there like who meet you, they care and like it's part of, you become part of this family. Um, so you automatically feel, I don't know, there are lots of facets to this. I think one, you automatically start to feel cared for, I think mm-hmm. as soon as you show up at the gate. Because mm-hmm. there, there's someone who meets you who like cares that you're there, who wants you to have a good time and it feels really good. Maybe that's just my experience, I got a good gate person, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But like, that was that. And then, while you're there, you're just constantly watching people let go, mm-hmm. or be themselves, mm-hmm. and not be worried about their surroundings or not be worried about the views of others or like what they're doing like Mm. it's just all these people who are putting down whatever they need to put down and being themselves Mm -hmm. and in that environment it becomes much easier for you to do the same because it feels safe Mm. and you know if you're if you're able to give yourself to it like it it feels good and it it feels safe Mm. and so i think that's really what happened like you you see these examples of people just being being them, mm. you know, and and it's kind of wonderful. Mm. And you know, when you talk to people, they want to know about you. They don't, you know, want to know what you do. I think I, I got there, and I, I talked. I had one conversation, one mm. for ten seconds, mm. th- about what I did in real life, mm. about what my job, your was. profession. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, and it was, and I entered into it reluctantly with another person who also entered into it reluctantly. We had like a moment where we were trying to find out more about each other, and we're like, all right. I'm going to do this. What do you do? <laughs> and it's like, and we like said it and then that was it. That was like, and then we just moved on. It just happened to be, we were both design people and we could, mm-hmm. I think, sense that about each other. Mm-hmm. So like that, it just became about people and about being yourself and seeing those examples of people being weird or outlandish or conservative or whatever that is, just mm-hmm. people feeling safe to be themselves. So I think it makes you feel safe about about being yourself and putting those things down and it makes it easier to be a bit more introspective and mm. less guarded 
mm-hmm. and less worried about whether or not you're making the right decisions about what to put down or when or I don't know. That was a thing. There are lots of things that happen to Burning Man. Yeah, yeah um, it's, it's hard to, I mean, for someone who's never ridden a bicycle before, how do you describe what's it like to ride a bicycle? You just can't. Right. Like you just, you really can't, which is what... Whatever you explain is only a facet of what's it like to ride a bicycle. And even if by some miracle I could somehow explain to you or convey to you in words the way that I felt or the things that impacted me, it still wouldn't matter because you would go exactly. and have your own experience. Right. And like some of, maybe that would happen, maybe not. There's actually a better chance. None of that, I have, some of that would happen. None of that would happen. You have no idea because right. we take from it what we put in it. And, mm. you know, I think you take from it what you need. So there are many experiences that maybe washed over me that just weren't as pivotal or that I didn't happen to grab at that moment. So, so actually, I mean, I could ask you more pivotal moments but I sure. since you're a design person right <laughs> yep. so you know I wanted to borrow your design lens right how mm. you look at the world because mm-hmm. you're a top-notch design person you're head of design in this particular company um, how can we create or design or curate an environment where people can be themselves and this is you know mm. as a cultural person this is mm. what I look at you know, how do we curate the environment to foster that right Mm -hmm. Burning Man did an amazing job and then who knows how well it'll scale because right now we're 70,000 people yeah yeah at some point it breaks right I don't know right I hope that it will go forever but but nonetheless bringing back to this like how can we bring some of those magic back in the environment that we're working whether it be the family life whether it be the work environment etc etc I think at the core of all those things, that those situations that you just kind of mentioned, is a sense of feeling safe. Mm. There's a thing about, and I said this actually during my interview here, um, where designers, I think all of us on some level, but designers, if I take it there first, need an environment where they feel safe. And, they, and what that means is they need to feel safe to explore, they need to feel safe to be creative, they need to feel safe to fail and screw up. Right, um, and I said that actually during one of my interviews, and I didn't get to give really a proper answer of what it meant for design to fail. And someone called me on that the other week, which I thought was great. They were like, "I still want to answer that question," and I was like, "I will still give it to you." Um, but like, design and creative people need a place where they can fail because you just you stifle creativity if you feel afraid to fail. Right? Mm-hmm. You just if you can't if you don't feel free to explore and try and experiment and like let things work or not work, then you don't learn, right? Mm-hmm. And design is about, it's about many things, but in part, it's about, you know, trying and failing and honing and, and making things better and refining, right? So if you don't feel free to fail, free to fail, then you have a problem doing that. And that breaks down the whole system. So like things like time crunches make it very difficult to fail. Like we all get it that sometimes you have to work fast and make things go on the spur of the moment. And sometimes it's better to just take, stick a stake in the ground and like move forward from it and then iterate. And that makes all the sense in the world. But I think making it okay to fail to a certain degree while mitigating that, obviously for business purposes, right? We can't, we, no one's ever going to let anyone make rash enough decisions that are like really going to tank anything. But you need room to like play and you need room, like you need room for the blocks to fall down so, when you so, play. So, so room for fail Mm -hmm. safety Mm -hmm. and play Mm -hmm. i hear these three things from what you said yep and um you know these are like very burning many things except for the safety third thing but it's a slightly different context um like you know that's 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 what you need and i think i think that's part of being human right like if we take it out of the design context for a second um, where you're talking about iterations and designs and testing things and putting things out there and seeing if they work and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> if you look at like just all of us, I was watching a show the other night. I, f- I forget the name of it. It was talking um, about, oh, I forget. It was it's like a, it uh, doesn't matter. It's on Netflix. I'll come up with it later. But part of it was about relationships and about what it means to be in a kind of a, a good human relationship. And they mm. were, one of the things is like feeling safe. Mm. Um, and I, that really resonated me with me because I think at the time when I went to Burning Man, I didn't feel safe. I felt very much at risk, and a whole every facet of my life felt risky mm-hmm. um, and, and scary, and like I was out of control, mm. and in a bad way. Because mm. there's something about being out of control in a good way, which can be very empowering and invigorating. Being, being out of control in a bad way, where you don't feel safe, mm. where if you fall down, 
you might not actually be able to get back up, mm. that's not good. Mm. So I think all of us in our relationships, in our work environments, in our home environments, you need to feel a level of safety so that you can play, so that you can do things outside of the norm, so that you can feel free to break boundaries and you can extend yourself into places mm -hmm. that don't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Because if you fall down, you know, that's scary, right? So if you're in a relationship where you feel safe, you feel like your partner has you, right? Mm -hmm. You feel like that person is with you. You feel like they're behind you. They may not have all the answers, you know, they may not like, they may not be able to say the right things all the right time, but it doesn't matter because you know that they're there and that's what you really need. Mm -hmm. And so like, in work environments are the same thing. Like, you know, you need to feel a level of safety. You need to feel, you need to feel that in your world, I think, mm. to be able to push. It's certainly helpful. How do you do that, though, for your team members, for your spouse, for your family? Like, how do you actually? So I'm mm. a tactical person. Right? Yeah, yeah, I want to yeah. make sure that people, the listeners, actually walk away with something that they can practice. Yeah. Like, principally, I totally agree, 100%. Totally, yeah. Want to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm there with you. Yep. How do I do it? How do I emulate it from your perspective? If I talk about design, like if I take it again from the small world, sure, we'll go big. Yeah, uh, yeah, let's do that. Like in the design world, like you need, as the person who owns design here, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's my job to make sure that the people on the design team have that they have time. It's about making sure that they have room to go explore. It's about making sure that they have, um, they have. I hate to use the term air cover, but like, you know, it's, it's, it's me who's, who's, who's going to look at our CEO and basically say, no, no, we can't get that done right now because we need room to iterate. Mm -hmm. And you're going to reap the benefit on that. And that's my job is to like create that, that environment and build that relationship with him mm -hmm. so that he believes me, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's a big part of my gig. Like my job is making sure that the people on this design team here have all the room that they need and all the influence that they need and the tools that they need and the environment that that they require to go play. Mm. Everyone has to be productive. Everyone has to get things done. Everyone's beholden to a schedule and we all understand that this is a business and we are here to make money. Mm. Um, but the truth is like our failing is actually good for the business mm. because it means we're trying ideas mm. and we know that if that one doesn't work, we'll, we won't go down that path anymore. And it's, mm. it's honestly, it's, and it's cheaper for us to fail on the front Absolutely. Right, than it is for anyone to fail on the back. So mm -hmm. I'd rather like erase a whiteboard or throw out a piece of paper, right, or delete a file rather than have to spend two to three sprints to go fix some implementation that, you know, we thought was a good idea that we didn't adequately like try or iterate on that didn't make a lot of sense. Like if we're, if you're far enough out over the edge, like that's expensive, right? Turning mm -hmm. engineers, it's expensive to turn an aircraft carrier. Like it's, that's a big deal, mm. you know, but you know, throwing out a piece of paper is really easy. Mm. So I'd rather take a handful of designers and put them in a room or a handful of designers and product people and engineers and put them in a room for a day or two and let them go play mm. and be weird mm. and think strange thoughts and come up with like new interesting ideas and then go iterate in smart ways on those things. Like then go try whole hog things and like go write code and do craziness and potentially make bad mistakes that are costly. Mm. So. That's all my job. My job is to put together, put in place those processes, that understanding, build that discipline, um, build that level of sensibility with our leadership. A container. Yeah. <clears throat> to put yeah. that, to make that space, right? Mm -hmm. My job is to make the space. My job mm -hmm. is to make essentially the, the playroom more or less. Like, yeah. So that not only the designers, but that everyone can get involved and yeah. we, can, we can all feel some level of safety in, uh, again, thinking weird thoughts because I think that's important. Okay. So... Bigger. In a, in a business setting for, you know, a school system mm -hmm. where we're taught that there is a right answer. Yep. Right. And <laughs> yep. here's one way to do things, this and that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can go down the path of philosophizing why True. that stifles creativity, mm -hmm. but I won't. Um, how do you ensure that people who feel safe to try weird things, strange things? Because mm -hmm. in a work environment, sometimes like maybe they were told, hey, you're too weird or mm -hmm. you're too strange. Your thoughts are too out there. Mm -hmm. You know, they get pounded mm -hmm. down for think being original. Mm -hmm. But in this place, in this particular context, they're mm -hmm. encouraged to be 
to be weird, to be mm-hmm. strange? How do you in- how do you bring mm-hmm. that out of them? Well, I think that's I think you just said it actually. You in this context, right? So you have to create these contexts mm-hmm. for people. You have to create these spaces and this process by which here's a place where we get to be like really weird. And so you actually say that? Yeah, I would. Be, yeah, absolutely. Be like, weird. Totally. One hundred percent. Be strange. Like, absolutely. Like I was. I, I mean, part of part of my career. You know, I was I was at Microsoft for a while, and one of my favorite things about Microsoft was the Microsoft research team, um, and uh, one because they're incredible people, and two just because they have um, processes in place, and a lot of companies do this, so it's not just exclusive to them, but like. They're big enough where they have some room to go do this too. Um, they have processes and and in place where people go and literally sit in a room. You have designers and you have engineers and you have product people and you have business people sit in a room and they're encouraged to be odd. Like you're encouraged to solve design problems around things that kind of relate to the technology or like kind of don't or like just think weird. Like we would do things like imagine you know imagine you're designing this interface right okay so you're doing an interface for a thing it's got to be able to do a b and c blah 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 and we all get that from like one particular context okay now imagine you were doing it from the context of a washing machine so it's like you know you know what a washing machine panel looks like and you know what kind of like how that feels and whatnot like imagine that's your construct you're doing it like that or you you know you're 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 looking at um, ways to solve certain problems and you're going to put yourself in the context of, okay, you run an organized crime family. How would this technology work to like solve your problems? Interesting. So it's, it's totally periphery, other context, yeah. other constraint. Other Thrown constraint. in there. Other organized crime family. Now yep. you're solving this for yep. this particular. Imagine you do this. Like you work with this technology. These are the things you're working with. But you are the head of an organized crime family. How would you apply that technology? Oh, to I you? love that. Right. That's so like. Great. So how does that? But with the guise of you want it to be productive, right? So sure. the the minds behind this, right, or that, which is usually is research primarily, and then maybe research in combination with design, mm-hmm. is like we're trying to solve something around some kind of data or some kind of capability or some technology that we're looking at investing in next quarter or some other thing, right? So we're looking to ideate on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but to get there, like, you want to get weird, mm-hmm. right? And you're told, like, literally, you sit down in the room and everyone goes, all right, today is a different day. You're not at your desk. You're not looking at email. You're not worried about these things. Today, we're going to get weird. Mm-hmm. Today, we're going to play with markers. We're going to play with balloons and tape and crap and like these things and yarn and whatever else we have laying around and we're going to like mm. we're going to think weird thoughts today and it takes people some time to warm up mm. and get weird but I think that's how you bring those bring it back to your original question I think that's how you <coughs> you have to provide the constructs and the spaces again the context mm. f- for where in which people can be weird mm. and be creative and are mm. free and specifically told mm. to think wildly mm. um and then give them other places where they take those things and then be tactical, right? Mm-hmm. So you take that thing and like something becomes an interesting idea about that organized crime family or whatever, and you go, wow, that's kind of cool. And invariably someone will take that and automatically start thinking, I mean, you know what, we could do this and this mm-hmm. and then do that. And then, wow, there's value in that, right? And then people go, yeah, that's kind of cool. Make sure you trap that, right? And you just write it down and you, and you put it on a wall. Mm-hmm. You just trap it and go. You like, just keep, don't linger. You just, mm-hmm. you know, you get it and you put it on the wall. You trap it and you put it in a pile. And then the next phase might be you go through that pile. And then maybe you refine. Or, you know, and then by the end of it, maybe you are getting more tactical. Maybe you're trying to bring it to more real world stuff. Or maybe it's just fun. So I also hear volume. Mm. Volume of ideas. Mm. Yes. It's, that's how you get to good ideas too, right? Is Absolutely. That, did I capture that? One, 100%. When I was in design school, we used to have to, there, we used to, like one of the things we did in design uh, one, I think we were like freshmen, like you had to do, well, design two, you had to do 50 thumbnails for everything. And a thumbnail is basically a little sketch. Let's say, let's take something mediocre. You're going to do a brochure for somebody or something. You're going to do a menu for a restaurant. I'm a graphic designer. So you're going to do a menu for a restaurant. You had to do 50 sketches of what that could look like. 50, mm. no less, at least 50. Mm. And that was the requirement. What's funny about that is that you always basically go back to your first like one, two, or three. Mm. But that's not really the point. The point is to get your head in a space of generating ideas and thinking creatively. Mm. Because at some point around 10, 12, you start to run a little dry. Mm. And then you're sitting there racking your brain trying to 
figure out where do you go next. And then, then you learn the techniques of being like, well, what if I turn it upside down? What if it's not a menu? What if I start with desserts first? What if I, what if I look at this visual as opposed to that visual? What if I look at it from this context completely? What if I, you know, what if it is electronic? What if it's something else? What if, and you have to like force yourself to think further and keep pushing mm. because, you know, even if you don't go back to those ideas, there's value in it because the next time you attack that problem, you're building that muscle. You're building that muscle in your brain mm -hmm. of thinking wildly, of thinking differently, of making sure that you're not leaving anything on the table. We can also come up with like basic ideas for all these things to get these things done. That's not how you push the envelope, and that's not where the real value is, and that's not how you push industries or markets mm -hmm. or come up with differentiators. You've got to think past that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I love that you used uh, analogies like muscles and, and things like that yeah. because that's something that people can grasp, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you are really, really good at design. So you are the Arnold Schwarzenegger of design, let's say, right? <laughs> the Mr. Olympic of design. No, right? that's cool. Do it. <laughs> so yep. how do you continue to push your own muscles, design muscles? Oh man. As a person, as a as a as a as a master, right? Because the grandmaster is never done. Like yeah, actually, no. let me use a martial art example. I was gonna say that's probably better. <laughs> uh, a lot of people think that hey, when I do martial arts, life is complete when I get the black belt. But the real practitioners know that your practice begins at black belt. Yeah. Because then you're now you no longer need to worry about the fundamentals. The basics, yeah. Right. Then yeah. Then, then the grandmaster is like, yeah, I can continue to craft this, and then now he can like cut someone with just like a leaf or something yeah. like that's like the, 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 the movies uh, what they show anyways going back to you so design so how yeah. do you how do you continue to craft uh, a master your own craft the only place where that I love that analogy by the way and I'm actually really flattered by that analogy um, the 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 only the thing it's different or where that analogy breaks down is that the environment it's one thing Maybe it doesn't break down because maybe I just don't know enough about martial arts, honestly. Um, place where I immediately think it's different or a place where I feel like it's different is that so the environment in which I practice. So I may be very good at it. As much as I know, there's exponentially more that I don't know because there are exponentially more problems out there to solve. There's an infinite number of problems to go solve, right? So as many problems as, as there are to solve is, is there's even more is exponentially more than that iterations on how to potentially solve them. So there's like a lot out there. There's a lot in like your toolbox gets bigger, but you know, just cause you know, I have a you know, fairly big toolbox and maybe I can like go build a house doesn't mean I can go build a 80 story skyscraper, right? That's a different thing. So we're constantly learning and the environment in which we're practicing is also changing. So um, before I was here, um, I, I, uh, one of the people on my team at my previous place was um, uh, right out of school. And um, it had been honestly a long time since I had managed anyone who was kind of right out of school. Mm. And um, that was uh, both terrifying and exhilarating um, mm. because I learned so much from that person right out of school. Because they from are teaching it or from the person, from just the from the person, from the, the person and like their practice and how they approach problems and how they look at things because the world is so much different, right? Like, mm. I, I know a lot of things and I have a lot of answers and I can come up with a lot of crap like off the top of my head because, yes, the muscle that I've built is like pretty strong and I know a lot, I've been a lot of places and I've seen things fail and I've seen things succeed and that's really great. So I can be fast, but like the world is different and it's always changing, especially the design world. The, Tastes change, the technology changes like as fast as you breathe. So the way that we approach these things, there are certain things that stay true, the way we approach problems, the way we're creative, the way we iterate, thinking weird, all that good stuff. But sometimes the technology we use like, drives our thinking in different ways. And it's really cool. It was really cool to experience my practice through his eyes with his way of thinking, the new technology and the way he approaches problems was like amazing um and it you know none of us are geniuses it's just different and it's like that's how we grow like we grow by pushing ourselves and there are no right answers right there are no right answers there are no wrong and wrong answers i don't want to go back to that either and dive into that crap but because i think we all agree on that um but there are some answers that are more right and some answers that are more wrong for any given problem at a particular place in time so 
how do you arrive at those things? So I don't know. How do I keep pushing? I'm always looking at what's new coming down the pike. I'm always looking at the market. I'm looking at the technology. I'm trying to understand what that means. Um, you're looking at culture. You're looking at the way people consume design because that changes. It's changed radically in my career. Like when I first started, you know, we were putting pictures on this thing called the I don't what's it the interweb or whatever that is. Like that was my world when I did the first website design in my major, um, and no one knew how to talk about it. To today, man, like that's just that's a hell of a leap. Mm. So the way we all consume design, the way we view it, the value that we place on it, the value that we don't place on it, um, the places in which it manifests itself itself more than not. When I first started, it was all print. Now, it, no, like it's it's rare to find people who deal with print, um, or at least it feels rare to me just because of the circles I've been in for a long time. Um, and I don't know, like it's just you just constantly push. I like to. I like to go back and forth. I like to pick up old tools. I like to, I don't know, I like to surround myself with different people who view problems in different ways. Like I said, that person I just work with or other people on the team. It's exhilarating coming here and being new because they're all new people who approach problems like in totally different ways, which is like fascinating to me because I love to think about the way people think. Mm. So yeah. I don't know. I, so, so let me actually recap a little bit. One yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there. everything. You know, a lot of wisdom that you just shared. Right? A, few, a few things. <laughs> a, so, lot words, anyway. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of words. A lot of words. A lot of wisdom. So, so, so you talk to people who are new. Yeah. Less experience. Yep. You look at it through their eyes. Yep. You look at new technologies. Yep. You try on different scenarios, the market or whatever. And yep. Just kind of you know scenario play in your head. Yep. You uh, interact with new environment, new people. Yep. You know, and um, anything else that I missed? And you, oh, right, you, you pick up old tools, you cross train, yep, right? Yep, yep, yep. Do you, do you uh -huh. purposefully, intentionally put yourself in places where you interact with people who think drastically different than you? As in, like, let's say, I don't know, use a political mm -hmm. term, right? I mean, probably that's not a good one. Uh, <laughs> uh, in, in, no, no, no. Uh, in, in design sense, maybe. You talk to a movie person. I don't mm. know if there's like yeah. a movie set designer. Oh yeah, cross like media. That. Yeah, cross totally. media. And then basically you talk to a designer, Love but that. a totally different realm. And mm -hmm. then you, you ask them how they do things, and you guys kind of yeah. you know, talk shop about this. Honestly, that, way. that is one of my favorite things to do in life: is talk about process with other creatives. Mm -hmm. um, and and I put engineers in creatives. Oh sure. Bucket too. Like those yeah. are that's like. Well, that, my actually. Why don't you define creatives, not a share of my definition of creatives? Ooh, that, I don't know if I have like a really good pat definition of creative. I think of you know, creatives are anyone who, oh Jesus. <laughs> wow, this is hard. Um, I, like, I wanna give a good sound bite right here and I can't. I um, feel like I should have this on the tip of my tongue if I were worth anything. Um, I don't know, I said engineers, let me backpedal and give myself a little time. Sure. I said engineers yeah. because um, I remember my first job out of college, I started working side by side with two of the best engineers I've ever worked with in my life. And he likened writing, he, the engineer, likened writing code to writing poetry. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a beautiful analogy. It's so elegantly put and so rightly put that I just, it stuck with me for all these years and I reference it all the time because it really is. And that's, that's what I feel. I feel like when you're a creative, you're doing your best to express your point of view mm. in the world. Mm. And that can manifest itself, I don't know if that's the best sound bite ever, but like that can manifest itself in any and all media and any and all things, whatever mm. that is, whether you're making something or you're writing something or you're crafting anything like code, you know, something completely, you know, virtual, which is code or something that's totally real, which is woodworking or like whatever that is, like, mm. you know, you're just, you're doing your best to create something in this world which is an expression of who you are and mm -hmm. like yeah maybe that's better yeah now yours because i feel like i tripped all over mine oh no <laughs> actually it's it's the same thing but in different words mm. to me a creative someone who manifests whatever is in his or her head externalized to the world mm. this could be a writer mm -hmm. could be a designer could be a programmer could mm -hmm. be a carpenter could be could be a painter, could be even a business, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, totally. It's very much anyone. So truly to me, any artisan 
are people who have this passion and able to craft themselves you know in whatever ways things that we can touch and feel even experience mm -hmm. and and to me that's a creative mm -hmm. so it's almost every single person as long as you're not just doing things mechanically yep to me you're a creative i would go along with that so um your other question i love i love talking to other creative people Mm -hmm. who are, I mean, I think, uh, proactively, I guess is maybe the best way to put it. Actually, I love talking to everybody. But like, I really love talking to other artists um, who work, artists and or designers, there's a whole other discussion, art versus design, who live in different media and express themselves in different ways because I love, really do love talking about the creative process and how people generate ideas and when they, you know, how they go from A to B to C, what their process looks like, how they how they start, how they arrive places, the way that they edit, you know, the, the, the avenues they allow themselves to take, the process, how much the technology or the medium dictates where they go. Like, I just, I love that. There's no judgment on how anybody does it because truly it's, a, I just, I find it beautiful. Like how, and I do that. I spend a lot of time with musicians mm -hmm. um, simply because music is a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, so I spend a lot of time talking to people about how they write music or how they songwrite. Um, because I find that just so intriguing. Um, I've had some, uh, I have a really, I have a, I have a good friend, uh, who's a painter. Um, and we've had some really amazing discussions about, about how we approach, you know, our particular worlds or about how, how we generate ideas and how it, which is fun because there's lots of language similarities. So we can, we can talk to each other in ways that we both understand and kind of get past technical things and, and and like get into this kind of real meat around how you generate ideas and what it looks like to look at a blank canvas and what it means to have an idea and how does that idea grow or how does it change or morph or does it, do, do you always have ideas like are you realizing a thing from the beginning I don't know I just I love these discussions in fact I watch videos one of my favorite things to watch on the internet are videos of painters designers who are talking about their process mm. Um, and I collect books about sketchbooks and stuff mm -hmm. because I find that fascinating. Um, things that we find valuable, and how they generate. Uh, so yes, I love that. I feel that's an incredible source of inspiration. Man. So I stumbled upon a interesting uh, reference to this guy, Goethe. Mm -hmm. He supposedly wrote a book about colors. Mm -hmm. And colors to me, to me as mm -hmm. an engineer, is like wavelengths, right? And mm -hmm. this wavelength correlates with this color, da da. But that's not how we interpret the world. We don't interpret the world. Look at different wavelengths of this and <laughs> the other thing. Right? <coughs> so from he wrote a book purely from a subjective perspective, mm -hmm. and he articulate this ineffable thing called color. Because my blue and your blue may be very different, yeah. but he is able to articulate. So, so in the world of design. Mm -hmm. Right, looking at the world through like colors, and because you mentioned a couple of things, how do you? I mean, there's so many different directions I can go. I wanted sure. to ask you two questions. Because mm -hmm. you talked about cross training, talking in different viewpoints, learn from a lot of different you know perspectives. Mm -hmm. That's going wide, right? Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that you're actually going deep in mm -hmm. terms of mastery? Because I can, I'm yeah. very much a generalist. I yeah. love talking to everyone, learn about everything. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. But how do you, mm -hmm. from the design point of view, go mm -hmm. deep as a designer? I mean, when I was when I was talking about, so I was just talking about conversations I was having with like that, my painter friend, mm -hmm. um, and we speak the same language. Right. Um, and that's about like your toolbox and kind of the. You know, you got to like you know learn all the rules before you can break them, kind of things. Like right, you've right. got to know the words, right, mm -hmm. so that you can get into it. Um, I feel like hmm, if I take this from a how do I still make sure I'm going deep? There are lots of lessons that I learned in school about how to talk about design um, and how about how to make it relatable to people or about how to communicate with other designers about things. And there are things about color and shape, it's all the theory stuff. You, would, you learn the same stuff like music theory, like it's all the same thing. Like you get these building blocks so that you can, or like you were just saying, you know, up until you hit your black belt, you know what I mean? You're learning tools, right? These are basics, these are things. And then, you're, then you really begin. 
that's when you become a master. That's when you become an artist. That's when you take mm. the tools mm. and you make mm. things. You make your own style. You make your own variations. You come up with your own patterns, your own bits and pieces, like your, your own interpretation of that discipline, of that medium, of that whatever that is. That's when it becomes really beautiful. Mm. Um, and I think, I don't know, I'm, I, I routinely go back to the, the core lessons that I learned when I was in school mm. as a designer and apply them to everything that I'm doing regularly. In those conversations with that painter, um, I, like, we'll start, I remember was, I was looking at like a new piece that he had done and I was like, this is amazing. I was like, tell me, do you always do a nine grid? Like, do you always do this? And like, is this always segmented this way? And your palette, like when you, when you start, like, do you start Man, here? You geek with out. The cool, yeah, there's totally, <laughs> and, and that, that's the best way to talk about it. It's like, it. you completely geek out. And that, that's what it means for me to go deep, right? People who geek out go deep, right? I have conversations with like, like, like Victor here about Porsches, right? Like he will geek out, right? About that. And that's what it means to be a, like, to go deep for me is to like really geek out on it. Like, I want to know, like, when you thought about that, did you like, were you at the grid like in the first place or like, did you, did you arrive there? Did you, did you like, how do you, how do you set up the rules around your palette and color and contrast, right? How, where, where do you want me to go? Like, cause I think you want me to do this, then this, then this, then this, is that what you wanted? Like, and those are the conversations that I love to have because that's in my head what it means to be like, that's the design aspect of things. Like I am setting up a language and a system and, and a world in which I know you're going to inhabit. And I need to make sure that you understand what those things are mm. and where you live. Again, so mm. you can feel safe. Mm. Bringing it back. Yeah, um, nice. So that like you can, you understand how to explore and how to examine and where to go and where I want you to linger and where I want you to, it to be like um, fleeting mm. and, and all that good stuff. Like, and I love that because I can have that, I can have that conversation with musicians. There's a book I want to write at some point. Please nobody steal it. Um, Actually, I don't know, who knows if I'll write it. If you write it and, and it's brilliant, I will love it and I'll read it and buy it. I, wanna, I want to talk. There's a way that I think we talk about music and a way that we talk about design that is very much the same. It's like repetition and variation. There's contrast. There's color. There's mood. There's places where you linger. There's places where, where, where you don't. Like contrast is big hits, big separations, loud, soft. You know, and then there's, there's other more moody places with analogous colors, right, where it's very, like, kind of soft and it's supposed to be more atmospheric and where I want, you know, where you want people to linger and kind of float. And then you want to take them to a different place and the piece has to have a point of view and, and all that good stuff. And I, I love, love talking about that. I remember one, one Christmas, talk about a super geek moment where I'm sure everybody wanted me to shut up, much like everyone listening now. Um, we were, my, my father is um, huge into realistic art. He's not so much into modern art. He doesn't, he, in his words, doesn't get it, which I always find funny. It's a whole other discussion. Um, but he loves Norman Rockwell. Mm. This is like his thing, right? So it's beautiful, like what beautifully illustrated, like heartwarming images of days gone by. And like he has this coffee table book. He's very excited to show me one year about this Norman Rockwell stuff that he got. And it's a beautiful book. Um, and Norman is a hell of a painter and an illustrator. So like he's like, isn't it beautiful? And I'm like, yeah, you know, and, and my, my wife was sitting there and uh, I was going through the book and uh, she challenged me and she was like, but like what makes him so special? Like what makes this special? And she wasn't being argumentative, she was, she was very conversational, but she was challenging me, like, you know. Challenging you, yeah. not your dad. Yeah, definitely not, mm -hmm. challenging me. And like, you know, what makes him so, like what makes this great? Mm -hmm. She was literally like asking, we're very open, like what makes this, so great and that other thing because there are lots of people who paint realistically mm -hmm. and I'm like okay and I should have warned her because I was like I'm just going to super geek out right, right now right, about right. like what's going on so I was like okay this you asked right? for it like here it comes right? so <laughs> it's kind of like asking me about Burning Man um, like here we go right so I opened the book and I'm like okay so take this piece um, what's great in that book is that there were sketches too but like if I just look at this piece let's look at how it's organized do you see this grid? Do you see how this lines up here? Do you see these sections? Do you see how this plays off of this? Do you see how this busy section plays off of this clean section? Do you see how this palette works? How your eye moves from, I'm gonna bet your eye goes here and here and here and here, right? It's like, yeah, and I'm like, right. He did that on purpose, specifically. He designed it that way, right? And then he executed. Like, 
he did that because he knew you were going to do that. He wants you to do it. He wants you to look at this, and then he wants you to look at this, and then he wants you to feel this way about it. And he takes you through a story here. Like, it's a process. And I'm not just wrong because he had, like, a couple sketches. And I'm like, you can see how it changed. See how it moved? In the beginning, it was here, and that was no good because you would have fallen off the page or you wouldn't have cared. Mm -hmm. But then he moved it and he changed it. So he keeps you here, right? And you can see that in the color palette. This was all red. Now it's green. Like, and she was just like, wow. And I'm like, yeah, so I'm a dork. This is what I do. This is my life. This is, how, this is the lens in which I see the world. Mm -hmm. this, is how, mm -hmm. this is why I do what I do because I can't be any other way. I mm -hmm. see that. And so I have to do something with it. Mm -hmm. And whether it's Norman Rockwell or a painting or a song or some other thing, I see that stuff and I can't like not. So I can geek out with you about do it. The, the, <laughs> this, but we'll do a three hour podcast. Yeah, I was going to so say, I do want to rein me in yeah, as much I, as possible. I wanna, no, I mean, Please. I definitely want to do a part two, part three for sure, mm. if, if you don't mind. But, but, but I wanted to touch upon one thing. Yeah. You, you talked about success and failure mm -hmm. in terms of design. And then obviously the audience will be smart enough to extrapolate whatever that means sure. in their own life, right? Sure. So, because design is such a, um, to us, mm -hmm. the layman, nebulous, like I feel it, mm -hmm. a good one, mm -hmm. versus the not so good one. <laughs> yep. But the nuance of it, is it 88, is it 89, is it 90? Like, I don't really yeah. know, but if it's a clear contrast, like a 90 and 10, like, yeah. oh, for sure, 90, yep. right, Wh whichever. Yep. So, from your point of view, what's a design failure and what's a design success? <sighs> You know what's funny is um, to that person here who asked me that question, right? Who was like, I want that answer. Like, right. what design failure is? And I was like, and it's a fair question. I should give you one. Um, I actually walked by him the other day. We still haven't gotten a chance to talk about it. Mm. Um, but I walked by him. I'll send him this podcast. Well, it's, it's, I, 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 he and I will chat about this. But okay. um, I walked by him the other day and I just quickly was like, you wanted an example? Windows 8. Design okay. failure. Okay. And he was like. Ooh. And I was like, right, we'll talk more later. Um, and what I meant, I kind of want to keep that conversation going, I think, for like years now. I think we should just, it's like a chess yeah. match where right, someone right. like makes a move and yeah, then six months. Drop, drop a hint. Yeah, just like six away. months later, like, you know, hits the timer and then like the board goes into a closet. And then yeah. a year later, somebody looks at the board again and moves another piece. Um, yeah. And I say that with love. And I say that because um, I was at Microsoft during the time when Microsoft really realized when Windows 8 was a failure. Um, and... Uh, um, or at least it certainly wasn't all that it could have been. And Microsoft was reeling from it and trying to figure out what to do with, um, with itself in the, in the face of that. And they were basically rebuilding as fast as humanly possible and trying to roll back some of the, the changes in there and like make it feel better for people. Um, and uh, the gentleman who owned the design for Windows 8 at that time moved from Windows and came into Microsoft office where I was working. And he took over the office design team. Mm. And uh, um, I probably shouldn't tell this story on a podcast, but why not? I still think it's a really great story because I think that um, I think it was a, kind of a beautiful lesson in the end. He came over and he took over the, the office design team. And at the time, there was a little bit of chatter underneath the, the hood there among the design team about like, you know, like, man, like we just made some like big maybe mistakes in Windows 8 and like there's a little nervousness about like him coming on board and what did that mean mm -hmm. and uh, I remember we did our first all hands with the whole design team and uh, we're sitting there and like it was kind of like the elephant in the room and he was addressing the design team for the first time he's a very impressive designer um, and I have lots of respect for him and um, he again the elephant there was a, another person on the design team who decided to and I give her all the respect in the world for this um who decided to ask this question, which was... The elephant in the room. The elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. She basically said, look, so you were responsible for the design, or how did she phrase it? She said, I think we realized that... Um, I'm going to have to paraphrase because I don't remember sure, exactly. Sure. She basically said, look, Windows 8 um, is, has arguably been deemed um, kind of a failure. Mm. What did you learn... Mm. from going through the design of Windows 8 mm. um, that you feel you can apply moving forward? That's a beautiful question. It was a beautiful question. It was mm. elegantly worded. It was perfect. 
It was absolutely perfect. And the only thing I felt more perfect than the asking of the question was the answering. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a very poignant moment because we all basically like looked at each other like side eye and it was like, well, there it is. Okay, so now what's he going to say? And what he said was wonderful. What he said was, he said, I learned, he said, fair question, first off. And then he said, I learned that you have to take people on a journey. Mm -hmm. And what he meant by that was, you can't go too far too fast. Mm -hmm. That people, again, need to feel safe. Mm -hmm. People need constructs around them that make them feel like they're in control. Mm -hmm. And you can introduce new things to them and new paradigms and new features and all that new stuff. Mm -hmm. But you've got to give them a place that feels, you gotta take them there. Mm -hmm. You gotta show them. Mm -hmm. You can't just like push them off a cliff mm -hmm. and like, like you know that the airbag that you've built down at the bottom of that cliff is absolutely perfect. It's got all the wonderfulness in the world. It's perfect. It's, yeah, it's like heavenly. It's amazing. You're gonna have the best sleep. It's the softest landing. <laughs> it's gonna be awesome. He didn't say any of this. This is all my color. All right, right, he really right. just left it. He's far smarter than I am and just left it at the, you gotta take them on a journey. Mm -hmm. But like, that's what it meant was that place where you can take them could be pure perfection. Mm -hmm. And he stood by all the design work he did in Windows 8 and I, I give them all the respect for it because there's a lot, of, a lot of good stuff in there. Mm -hmm. just, people weren't ready for it. Mm -hmm. And you can't just push people off a cliff and have them trust you. Mm -hmm. Like, trust me, jump. Mm -hmm. Or here, I'll just shove you. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You've got to show them the stairs. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or you've got to show them the bag down there, right? Mm -hmm. And you've got to say, and you've got to answer their fears. Mm -hmm. You've got to show them that like, there's a way to get there. Mm -hmm. And um, even though you can see it, you know where people are going to go, you're, there's, a, there's a process to introducing that new change. Mm -hmm. um, and if you make people feel unsafe, they're going to balk. No one's mm -hmm. going to jump off that cliff. It's mm -hmm. not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, because people are, are generally resistant to change. So you've got you to help them feel good about it. And yeah, mm -hmm. that was a, that was a, it was, it was, I think it was, a, it was a tough moment, but it was a well handled Mm -hmm. um, on both sides. Yeah. On both so sides, like, on, on yeah. all sides. Yeah, it was really, really well handled. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what it means. for de That's one way mm -hmm. that a, a good example, at least, of design failing. You go too far too fast. Mm -hmm. You can see it. Mm -hmm. But people aren't willing to take that trip with you. Mm -hmm. So you got to take them on a journey. It's important. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So on that note, I want to make sure that the people who listen to this actually have something tactical. Yeah. They can, they can, some, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about some of the personal disciplines that you have as a way to help other people feel safe around you, whether it be new acquaintances, new room that you walked into, uh, new employees or mm -hmm. new friends. I mean, whichever, right? Yeah. Just new, new people in your life so that they feel, feel safe around you. Because I, I can tell you from personal experience, that's not my best feat. <laughs> my my <laughs> trait, I'm, I'm the guy who would just shove people over the cliff and say, see, I told you, it's going to be fine. You're welcome. Yeah. Um. So, so not my best. Uh, so I'm learning a lot from here. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know, man. Take it all with a grain of salt. There's yeah, like, yeah. I don't think there's any magic bullets. It's just like, you know, my experiences and then everyone else's is like, you just, yeah, add them to the toolbox. So, so what are some of the disciplines that you use for, let me mm. perhaps even broaden this question a little bit. Yeah. What are some of your personal disciplines that you have to, to ensure that Frank operates from groundedness, <laughs> from, from like the best Frank that friend can be, <laughs> then perhaps you can include, you know, the aspect that you mentioned. <laughs> um, I think the most important thing in my life uh, that I do is something that I didn't do, which is I got lucky and I happened to find the best uh, wife on the planet um, because she's the one who keeps me most grounded all the time. Mm -hmm. um, How does she do that? Oh, she constantly calls me on my shit. Oh, okay, great. God, love her for it because <laughs> I am full of shit, <laughs> as anyone who's listened this long knows. Um, and uh, so I surround myself with, let me, I'll, I'll extrapolate from there. I surround yes. myself uh, with people who uh, I think are free to call me on my shit uh, mm -hmm. and I encourage them to do it. Um, I don't always respond well to it because I, like I like to believe that I am grounded and I can be safe and I'm a great active listener and I can do all that shit and I'm very enlightened, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, I like everyone else like fight to do that or be present like before we even started this podcast because um, there's a lot of influences in our world. So I fight or I proactively try 
to be present. I proactively try to listen. I try to keep those as active things in the front of my brain. Um, so like a mantra that you have? More or less, yeah. I mean, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a fine way to put it. Um, that's, that's, that's basically what I, what I try to do. I am not, I try to be a great listener. Um, and I'm not always a great listener, but I, I definitely try to always remind myself to, you know, listen more and talk less, which is very difficult for me. Um, <laughs> again, as we've seen, I apologize to everyone. Um, <laughs> someday I'll get rid of that home thing too, but yeah. I don't know if I have actually great advice here. These are things that I fight too. Um, I want to be better. When I come into a new circumstance or a new situation, like let's say this particular job, mm-hmm. there's, a, there's kind of a prevailing, I don't know, uh, how would you put it? idea thought whatever that when you start a new job like you should generally like shut up for the first 90 days generally the first 90 you should just listen because primarily um because there are lots of people that are already there there are lots of good ideas already in place you need to figure out how you can best serve that environment right Mm -hmm. not not bull in the china shop it right just kind of jump in there and and potentially piss everyone off like you listen it's like you would do with any good client as any any good designer knows right Forget who said that. You know, you've got two eyes. You got two ears and one mouth. You know, you should use them accordingly. Um, so I try to do that um, as much as possible. I try to listen. Um, and uh, beyond that, man, I don't know if there's any other like great words of advice. I really do feel like that's the most important thing you could probably do in life. Um, is just listen, because the more you listen, the more you'll learn. And the more contrasting opinions you'll hear, the more tools you'll get for your toolbox, the more adages you know you will you will find entering your world, the more people you'll let in, mm. the more varied opinions, and all these things make you stronger right all the learning learning and being able to see the world from various points of view, I believe mm. makes you a richer person mm. um it makes you better informed uh, it gives you better grounding and better footing. Mm. Um, it gives you better information for you to form your own opinions. Mm. Um, and if you constantly are willing to do it, then those who listen well are open to change. Mm. And to be successful in this life, I feel like you've got to be open to change. Mm. So if you're not listening, you're not changing. There's another great quote I wish I could throw out right now, but I can't think of it right now. Mm. Um, but you know, if you are not changing, you're not growing. Mm. And yeah, I don't know, listen listen more beautiful so let's extrapolate that a little bit more do it because you're at a place where you have a team Mm -hmm. you hire for teams Mm -hmm. you are also a grandmaster in design and bring bring back that analogy right so from a grandmaster's perspective you know a lot more perhaps i mean not perhaps for sure Mm -hmm. than some of the people that you manage Mm -hmm. so a couple of things one how do you select the people who you want to be on your team because you know like I said this from an outsider perspective design is such a nebulous thing how do sure. you discern mm-hmm. just a is he this person a grade 88 or a 98 like mm-hmm. right so so one and two um, when you mentor someone mm-hmm. how do you level them up mm-hmm. what's your point of view there yeah. So there's so the team and the individual. We we start with the team. Teams teams are teams, right? They are they are they are groups of people who come with varying levels of skills, right? Mm-hmm. And not only varying levels of skills, varying levels of interests, um, varying backgrounds. Uh, you know, they're they're good at some things. They're 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 not so good at other things. And I feel like in hiring or building a team, um, man, generally speaking, I look for people who are who are better than me at, um, at the things that I am not so good at. Uh, Mm -hmm. and then I look for, I mean, it depends on, it really depends on the environment and what that team needs, right? There are Mm -hmm. certain places where you need, if I get really tactical for a second, there there, there. there are certain places where you need like, where you need better visual design. There's certain places where you need more interaction design. If we talk more software kind of related design Mm -hmm. problems, uh, there are certain teams that need more research skills, certain teams that need all these varying, Things in terms of subdisciplines of design, or you know, UX or product design, or however, what fashionable term you want to throw at it, mm-hmm. um, you 
the the team itself has holes right and it has places where it needs bolstering and so that's how you hire in my opinion at the most basic terms that you've got a team you've got people um you talk to them you get to know them you see where their strengths and where their weaknesses are and so then you hire over the weaknesses right because you need to make the team needs to be well-rounded and at the core of every team is an understanding or should be an understanding that everyone brings different stuff to the table all of it is valuable and the team is greater than the team is is only great as the sum of its parts, right? So you rise and fall as a team. These are important things for me. You rise and fall as a team um, and everyone's voice is important and all of that good stuff. And there are plenty of things that I am really not good at. Mm -hmm. So I may be good at some, at, at certain things, but there are lots of things I'm horrible at. <laughs> so I tend to try to find people who are really good at those things. I see. Because they help bolster. I see. Um, because I can't, I, my job isn't to have all the answers, right? My job is to guide, and my job is to create spaces. My job is to, um, uh, to, to, to help lead an overall vision, right, and help us get to a particular place. But, you know, I may not have all the answers all the time. I may have a few short win ones, but getting deep, you know, that's, you know, other people may take that on, or maybe I'll get deep. I don't know. The team, you know, flows and flexes. We do what we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's kind of how I view. When I became a manager... When I started managing people, I was so insane to think about. I was 25 years old when someone mm -hmm. gave me my first team. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks, Al. You're nuts. I still can't believe you did that. But um, I got to hire a team of five people, and, um, and they were like, just some phenomenal people. And early on in that time, I didn't know how to manage, and I was really scared. And I found this guy. Uh, his name is Bruce Mao, and he's, a, he's an exceptional designer, um, and he's a very famous uh, and uh, he runs a small practice in Canada and basically I found him and he has this whole book called Lifestyle and his whole I latched onto his ideas about management and about design team leadership which is very much you know it, it's it, every he, he, he fervently believes everyone should have a chance to lead everyone should have a chance to lead everyone should have a chance to fail the design um, environment the studio should be like an educational or like a university like environment you should always be learning um, everyone has a voice he's got this very democratic way of thinking about things in very flat organizations and stuff like that. And those are the organizations I tend to gravitate toward. And he became... So, so he instilled this value in you. He did. He those ideas. He became kind of a model, I as see. it were. And yeah. for a young guy who had no idea what he was doing, mm -hmm. um, who was suddenly... Who asked mm -hmm. for this challenge. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, not begged for it, but like really campaigned for it. And then someone went, okay, go ahead. And then I sat back and went, oh shit. Here's, mm -hmm. oh crap, I don't even know I, what, uh, okay, good. So I needed a model and that was kind of what I followed and that was what's important to me today. With, so those are teams. Mm -hmm. With individuals, um, with individuals it's, I don't want to say it's more complicated because that's kind of counterintuitive, but like mm -hmm. people are complicated things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just when you mentor someone or you're trying to bring them up and the discipline it's not just what I want, right? It's, it's far more important, like what they want, right? Like my job is to make sure that the people on the team, in fact, the people that are around me, you know, as an executive, that they feel, again, safe, we'll bring it back around, um, that they feel that, that their career's well cared for, like that they're in good hands, that they have work that makes them in, feel good and inspired and creative that mm. that they have challenges in front of them that that make them feel like they're pushing their career and their life and their discipline and whatever is most important to them ahead mm. and again i say whatever is most important to them right mm. we bring people into the company we bring people into th the business or onto the team because they bring something um and they bring something valuable they bring a point of view they bring a skill set they bring whatever that is and it's our job to make sure that we foster that. It's mm -hmm. my job to make sure that um, that's being recognized. It's mm -hmm. my job to make sure that that's being well leveraged. Um, and yes, these are all the things that I kind of believe. I believe that, you know, I believe in conversations. I like, one of the things that drive me crazy, depending on like what company I work for, I'll always sit in a room and someone will be talking about the review cycle and they'll be talking about, you know, as managers, you know, you should make sure that you talk to your employees once a quarter or some ridiculousness like that. And I'm like, once a quarter? Like, you need to talk to your people. It doesn't, and it's not micromanaging. It's like you just, you need to talk, right? Like you need to know like where people are. You need to, 
you know, not just take a temperature, but like form relationships with people for God's sake. Like if you need to be told that as a manager, you need to be fired. Mm. That is not a thing. That's just, that's, that's not a manager. That's mm. not a person whose main job is the care and well-being of another person. Like that's not, I, f- I feel like it's flawed. I, that's a, there's a thing in me about how I view management and, and your responsibility to your team mm. or those that you're managing that I take very seriously. Mm. Um, I feel it. So it, it, it really it, it's co- it really is core. I happened to grow up at that time. That guy Al, love you, man, who gave me that chance at the time was a guy that I would walk through fire for. Mm. Um, I would do anything for him. If he told me to jump off that cliff and it would be cool, I'd do it. And I wouldn't have thought twice about it. Does that mean he's perfect? No, mm. it doesn't. Love you, man. But like, he was one hell of a mentor. Uh, and there's another guy who's um, no longer with us, whose name is uh, Rich Frisbee, who was amazing too. Um, but these are the people who shaped me as a young guy or young leader, young person, you know, and instilled in me that this kind of belief that, you know, people, you know, it's people over everything else, honestly. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. I saw that it, you were moved by these names that you mentioned. Yeah, that, there's, um, there are a lot of people who I hold very dear in my heart from, uh, from a long time ago. And um, unfortunately, some of them, or at least one of them, is no longer with us. And uh, that makes me sad mm. every time I think about it. But mm. yes, Beautiful. he was very important. Thank you for sharing that. Now, do you have a circle of, I mean, we, this, this, this podcast is about, primarily about men, what it means to be mm. men in modern times, mm. right? Do you... Do you have a particular point of view about that? Like, how do you be a man in modern times? Man, I don't, that's such a, it's such an interesting, it, like, I don't want to say it's a loaded question. It's like an interesting question. And like, it's funny because there are labels in that question. There's man and then there's modern times. I'm like, what does that really mean? And, sure. and, and I don't know if I have too much of a point of view on that and it's funny if it's gonna sound like I'm dodging but it's like I feel like it's hard to figure out what it means to be a human in modern times honestly mm-hmm. like we have so many influences and so many ways that we are exposed to information or ideas or points of view and so many things mm-hmm. tugging at us I think mm-hmm. all the time that are demanding our attention and pulling us from being present and pulling us from real people or real relationships or things or mm-hmm. you know the phone screen you know and I'm guilty of it too like it it's tough. Um, I feel like it's difficult for us to all figure out how to prioritize things in our lives. Mm-hmm. And at least that's something I struggle with mm-hmm. all the time. And uh, um, I have, you know, are there people in my life that I talk about that with? Honestly, there should be more. Mm-hmm. I, it's weird. I feel like as, as I get older, like there are people, it is weird. There are people that I talk to like maybe every nine months or something that I consider my best friends. And that is a weird thing like for me to say out loud, but I believe it like in my heart, like there are people who are so important to me, but I rarely get the chance to like interact with them. And that makes me sad, but like they are my best friends. And it's, they're those people that you can call up and you like pick up the conversation like two years later from exactly where you left off. And that's totally cool. Um, again, it's sad because you don't get to interact with them all the time. I don't get to interact. But I feel like my circle of friends is like very, very small these days. I have lots of acquaintances. Lots and lots. Um, 5,000 Facebook friends. Yeah, you know, it was like we all, and even like, <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even look at that number anymore. It's like so funny, those numbers and like those circles of people. But mm-hmm. um, there are lots of people that I feel like I really do manage multiple circles of friends and they're important to me. Um, from particular contexts or in particular ways, they're all important as humans, um, but they all kind of touch my world. And so, let me ask you a follow-up question there. Yeah. Why are your best friends your best friends? Like, can you unpack that? And, and by the way, yeah. I, I, I'm not just targeting. That's you a good question. Say right, and this is a, a a thoughtful question. It is. So, is it is it proximity? Is it longevity? Is it you guys went through some. I mean, I don't want to yeah, plant yeah, yeah. words in your mouth, but you know, what, no. Why are your best friends your best friends? No, that's where I was leading for sure. Like, it's obviously not proximity, right? It's not um, like or 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 frequency. Um, uh, you know, those people like the, the, there's uh, my best friend in life uh, lives in in Boston um, or in Cambridge, and 
uh, I don't nearly get a chance to talk to him as much as I, I would like. Um, and I miss him and I miss his family. And, uh, you know, it's funny. What does it mean to be a best friend? I don't know. Um, I, I think I consider him my best friend because we, he makes me feel safe. Mm. Um, he and I have talked about, he's been, I think we share extraordinary experiences um, together. Uh, we certainly with the Burning Man together. Like he, um, he's been instrumental in my life. He's almost like a mentor as much as he is a best friend in a lot of ways. Uh, and it's weird because I never really thought of it that way before, but like it's probably true. Um, he's uh, in a lot of ways a model, or I view him that way, uh, for like how to live your life in certain ways. There's certain things I think he's done particularly well, and I, I'm, I'm in awe of that, um, of aspects of his life, which are like, it's very cool. Um, <clears throat> he's put together a beautiful family. He's got a stellar career. Like, he seems to deal with challenges very well. Like, it's, he's like, it feels very, like, aspirational to try to be like him in, some, in lots mm. of ways. So he's someone I feel brings a lot of um, stability and, like, joy to, like, my, my world. Um, so I don't know, and yeah, and like we just we've gone through a bunch of crap together. Like we really have. We've gone <laughs> the the we've known each other. I think for man, how long have we known each other? Jeez, man, has it been like twelve years? Has it been that long? That's weird. Mm. It feels like it. And what's funny is it feels like it's been forever, but it's only been twelve years. But that feels long. Mm. Twelve, fourteen, something like that. Um. Anyway. Yeah, I don't know. I think there are those people that you feel like you can be vulnerable with. Mm. I think that's the. I think that's what it means to be to be to to have a best friend. Mm. It's someone who, you know, will call you on your shit, mm. um, and you know that, but you still feel free to tell them about all the mistakes that you're making, mm. right? That you mm. like, but you know you're going to hear it, and that's okay. Like you want it, you know what I mean? And I mm. maybe maybe that's it, or at least a part of it. I don't know, it's a really thoughtful question. I feel like we could sit here and talk a lot about that. Do you um, actively cultivate? Because you do say you, you know tons and tons of acquaintances, right? No. And then do you feel like <laughs> these are opportunities that you can potentially have more best friends? I, or, or that only happens when you go to Burning Man. <laughs> 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 um, it's funny. I, no, it, no, I don't. I, man. Geez, now you're going to get me to just talk about my own failings. No, I feel like, I, I constantly feel like I let people down, generally speaking, um, mm -hmm. and that I'm not taking advantage of the friend group that I have. I know some particularly wonderful, beautiful, lovely, creative, um, you know, strong people that I don't, I don't spend enough time cultivating relationships with. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those things that, you know, I... I beat myself up about a lot mm. um, and it's one of those things that thankfully my wife beats me up about a lot too um, because she's regularly in a very lovely way I'm sure in a very lovely way yes. um, uh, and I appreciate her and love her for it mm. um, and I hope she never stops mm. because she constantly reminds me that you know I am not an island mm. and um, I need people in my life and um, you know and that I need to put more time into that. And that is, uh, it's true. Because I don't put nearly enough time into it. If I were smarter, mm. um, I would spend a lot more time doing that. And I would, um, yeah, I would take better advantage of the wonderful people that I have around me. I have a lot of like, I say I have a lot of acquaintances, which feels like, weirdly feels like they're throwaway. They're not, they're, they're very, I have very strong strong acquaintances I guess is maybe the more, more gray area way to put it I have no idea like there are people who are very very special to me that I I really do I wish I did have more best friends I wish that um, I wish I felt like I had more time or I felt like I don't know I had more to give I, I don't I don't know it's very difficult it's hard for I, it's hard to balance mm. things it's hard to balance life and mm. it's hard to balance or at least it's hard for me to balance mm. life and the demands of life and those things that are most important to me. I wish I had more time for my family even. I, I always feel like I'm running out of time. Mm. I think it's a thing. I think that's a very common yeah. thing, especially uh, the more 
in modern stimulus, times. Right, <laughs> so that we have, the, the more we have going on, the more we have that. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I wanted to actually bring it to an end. Yep. Because uh, we can definitely do a part two, part three for sure. We can talk for hours about things like this. Uh, at least I feel. I, I don't know if you for, want to. But I could I talk, talk for hours yeah. about anything if you no, haven't picked that, it up already. No, that, that's great. I love that. I definitely <laughs> feel your passion. So <laughs> for things. anyone that's listening yeah, who really wanted to be the greatest version, the greatest man possible mm-hmm. that they can be in this time, in this mm-hmm. lifetime, right? What would be like the one thing that they could do as a way, you know, maybe from the design point of view, maybe from a human point of view, what would be one thing that we wanted to leave with them? Something that's tactical, something that's actionable. Call your best friend. Mm. And I say that like, I don't, I don't just mean that like flippantly just because it's the closest thing that we were just talking about. I really mean that. I mean that because I literally have been, for the past uh, three weeks, meaning to call my best friend. And I have thought about it every day. I really have. Oh, I gotta call him. Damn it, I gotta call him. Shit, I have to call him. Crap, I missed this weekend, I didn't call him. Totally wanted to call him. Shit. Um, And I still haven't done it. Mm. So it sounds stupid. And it sounds small, um, but like, and it doesn't matter how long you talk to that person for or what the hell you talk about, but like, just reach out to that person that you feel is your best friend, who's close to you, who you could just chit chat with mm-hmm. about whatever the hell is relevant in your life right now. Get that in humanity and get that moment mm-hmm. because I think it's recharging. I know it would be recharging for me, mm-hmm. and yet I seem to let life continuously pull me out of that moment when I should be picking up a phone and or using my phone more for what it's really designed for rather than checking various feeds that mean nothing about my actual real life. Mm. Um, and I should use it to call that person. Mm. So, I don't know, call your best friend and say hi. And if it lasts for all of 30 seconds, cool. And if you're on the phone for an hour, awesome. But like, go get that human experience. Mm. Hey Frank, I want to acknowledge you for being so open to share your point of view, to share about the world design, to uh, honestly teach me a few lessons about what it means to make people feel safe, the importance of it, and also the importance of getting in touch with the people that I love in my life. Um, I do a terrible job at doing that as well myself. So when I ask that question, what makes you know, people's best friend, their best friends. I'm asking that for my, for me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was answering it, trying to figure it out for myself. Yeah, yeah. So, so I really acknowledge <laughs> you for everything that you brought. You know, I just, you know, I really feel the passion that you have for the world design and for the people in your life. So thank you so much for being so right generous. On. Thank you so much for having me. This has been, uh, this has been fun. Yeah. Actually.